channel. My name is Carly Stevens. I'm the author of the Young Adult Fantasy Fury and Rising, and this is English Nerd. So I have just recently started this series all about A Tale of Two Cities. So if you have not watched the previous episode, then make sure you go back and do that. Today I'm going to be talking about book one, chapter four, The Preparation, which is really the chapter that I think gets things uh, actually started off even though we're introduced to some of the major themes and at least one of the major characters in the chapters before this, uh, the preparation actually gives us an idea of where the plot is going more than the previous chapters had. So let's dive in. Mr. Laurie is the one that we've met so far, Jarvis Laurie, and he has been taking a mail coach all the way to Dover, which is right here between Paris and London. I talked about how it's important that it's between Paris and London because those are the two cities of the title. So he arrives in Dover, finally, and goes into his room, changes, and it's like he becomes a different person. I said last time that uh, people are mysteries, and that is a significant theme, a significant idea in Dickens, all of all of his work uh, here. So when Mr. Laurie comes out, we get a better idea of the kind of man that he is. And I want to just point out a couple things here in the initial good description that we get of uh, Mr. Laurie, who's grown on me more and more as, as I've reread the story. So this is about the second page of that chapter. It says, very orderly and methodical he looked, with a hand on each knee and a loud watch ticking a sonorous sermon under his flapped waistcoat, etc. Orderly, methodical, this watch is ticking. He's introduced to us as a man of business, a man who likes logic and order. So I have a theory, and I believe others hold it as well, that Dick one of the things that Dickens was considering when he was writing A Tale of Two Cities is how best to live. What is the most important ingredient in being, uh, in living well and being human? So bear with me for a second. Dickens wrote in the Victorian era, right? The mid 1800s. <clears throat> um, the two eras before that in British literature, so we have Victorian. Before that, we had the Romantic era, which was all about emotion, all about instinct and, and digging into your subconscious and that sort of thing. And then before the Romantics, there was the Enlightenment, which was all about logic, reason. Reason was what was separ separated us from the beasts and allowed us to uh, live with a sort of civil um, virtue. So you had the Enlightenment, the Romantics, and the Victorian era. So I said, bear with me. So Dickens is writing during the Victorian era about the French Revolution time, which was right between the previous two. So it was right at that at that uh, moment where people were starting to to switch their views, or the next generation of people, really more so, decided to break away from that tradition of logic and reason and to go more toward. Emotion. So in A Tale of Two Cities, we have characters and events that represent both of those earlier eras as Dickens is considering which which of the two, reason or emotion, is actually more important to living a good life. So Mr. Laurie, the way that he's described is, in my opinion, just a screaming example of an enlightenment figure. Somebody who is all about reason, all about business and logic and his descriptions bear that out. So he is there waiting for um, the young lady, Mamselle, from the note in chapter two, to show up. And somebody comes up and asks him about his place of work, Telson's Bank. Uh, is Telson, Telson's Bank is in London, right? And, and Mr. Laurie replies, we are quite a French house as well as an English one. So, Mr. Laurie is important to the story for a variety of reasons. He's our Enlightenment figure, so he kind of represents that side of things. He is the vehicle that goes back and forth between France and England, and the reason that he goes back and forth primarily is for business. It's because his bank has branches in both places. Of course, there's more to his character than that. He's not just a, he's not just a robot, although he wishes he were. So Mamselle finally shows up, and it is, as you guys know because you've read the chapter, 
uh, Lucy Minette. Lucy spelled the French way with the I-E. Now, she is an interesting character. She's obviously, since you've read the story, or at least up to this point, she's a very important, she's a central character to everything that happens in the story, but her description tells us something about um, Dickens himself that I want to point out. So Mr. Lurie goes to meet Lucy because he has some very huge news to deliver to her. And this is, the, this is part of the description that we get of Lucy at Minette. It says, As his eyes rested on a short, slight, pretty figure, a quantity of golden hair, a pair of blue eyes that met his own with an inquiring look, and a forehead with a singular capacity, remembering how young and smooth it was, of lifting and knitting itself into an expression that was not quite one of perplexity, or wonder, or alarm, but merely of a bright, fixed attention, though it included all the four expressions, etc. So we have this golden-haired, blue-eyed, uh, slight, very pretty, expressive forehead <laughs> uh, young woman in Lucy Minette. The description is point for point, the description of somebody that Dickens knew and in fact inspired the character. It's, it's crystal clear, let me make a case. So Lucy Minette is basically Ellen Turnin. Ellen Turnin was a young actress that Charles Dickens acted with in The Frozen Deep, that play by Wilkie Collins that inspired the plot of A Tale of Two Cities. She was 19 at the time. Uh, here she is, she's really pretty. And Dickens was in his 40s um, in a rather loveless marriage with Catherine Hogarth. They had like a million children, but uh, a lot of them died and they just, they didn't get along well, Catherine Hogarth and, and Charles Dickens. So I'm sure you can see where this is going. Dickens developed a massive crush on Ellen Turnin and we're not sure how far the affair went, if it was uh, merely emotional or physical or what. Uh, it was all very secretive, but there was a clear, um, both of them liked each other very much, and it actually led to Dickens' separation from his wife. It was a year before uh, Tale of Two Cities was written. So, Ellen Turnin is clearly the inspiration for Lucy Minette. I just wanted to throw that out there. It's somebody that he actually knew and liked very much. So, Mr. Laurie's news is that her father has been found alive. He was supposed dead, but he's actually been in prison, in solitary confinement, and nobody knew until recently when he was released. So, um, a little bit further in the chapter, Mr. Laurie is trying to get across this news, but as a logical, reasonable man, he fears emotion, and he he is trying to he's, he's trying his best to get across this extremely emotional news in a way that will be just like uh, some numbers in a bank account. So he says, Miss Minette, I am a man of business. I have a business charge to equip myself of. In your reception of it, don't heed me any more than if I was a speaking machine. Truly, I am not much else. I will, with your leave, relate to you, Miss, the story of one of our customers. He doesn't call. Dr. Minette, her father, a friend. He doesn't refer to him in any way except to say that he is uh, a customer. And he calls himself a speaking machine. You can't get much more spockological than that. So then he does that thing where if you don't want to admit that you're talking about yourself, you're like, oh yeah, I have, I have a friend with this particular problem. Lori does the same thing with Dr. Manette. He says, there was, a, there was a customer, you don't know him, he was a doctor, he had a daughter, and he just, he starts telling the story of what happened to, to uh, Dr. Manette, who came from Beauvais. I actually was in France a couple years ago, two years ago, and the bus passed by an exit that said Beauvais, and I was very excited because where Dr. Manette is from, so I had my, my happy nerdy moment there. Okay, so Lucy, <clears throat> excuse me, Lucy 
it catches on pretty quickly because Lori is not very good at this pretending business. And she starts to feel like she knows Mr. Lori from somewhere. And in fact, she does. When she was, I'm surprised she remembers though, when she was a baby, Mr. Lori was the one who carried her, who took her physically from France to England as an orphan. Um, and that was the last that they'd, that they'd seen each other. Okay, um, so finally it gets to the point and Lucy says, please just give me the truth, just just give it to me straight. As she kneels and says, dear compassionate sir, just tell me the truth. Lori gets all flustered and this is one of my favorite Lori moments in the entire story. He says, uh, a matter of business. You confuse me, and how can I transact business if I'm confused? This isn't business, this is personal, but... How can I transact business if I'm confused? Let us be clear-headed. If you could kindly mention now, for instance, what nine times nine pence are, or how many shillings and twenty guineas, it would be so encouraging. I should be so much more at my ease about your state of mind. Let's do some mental math. That, that'll make everything better. That's, that's, the, that's all reason and logic. It'll make me so much happier about your state of mind. Of course, this comes across as silly, which is interesting. A lot of times the reasonable characters are the ones that, of course, are reasonable and, and we trust them. And we tr it, there's no reason not to trust Mr. Lorry. That's not what I'm saying. But he's portrayed here as kind of, kind of silly, like reasonable, but to a fault. <laughs> Don't be upset about your father suddenly being alive when you thought that he was dead all these years as you were growing up. She's 17 at the moment. No, no, don't be, don't be sad. Just do some mental math and everything will be just fine. <laughs> so finally he admits, and I want you to notice the wording here. He finally says, okay, he has been, been found. He is alive. Greatly changed, it is too probable. Almost a wreck, it is possible, though we will hope the best. Still, alive. Your father has been taken to the house of an old servant in Paris, and we are going there. I, to identify him if I can, you, to restore him to life, love, duty, rest, and comfort. So, he says, I'm going to go to identify him. You, Lucy, are going to go to restore him to life. There's another echo of that resurrection motif throughout the entire story. You're going to restore him to life. He was and is like a dead man now. We don't know if he's a wreck or what, but you're going to be the one to bring him back to the land of the living, to resurrect him as it were, which is, as I mentioned before, a super important idea that keeps coming up again and again. So the old servant in Paris we'll see in the next chapter is uh, Ernest Defarge. And it's easy to forget that he was a servant of Dr. Manette since he owns a wine shop now and has a different kind of life. So Lucy faints, as she does. I mean, okay, so as you can probably tell, I'm not the biggest fan of Lucy. She just is a bit too much of a straw man character for me. There's, she's, she's, she needs more negative traits, I believe, because Dickens can create characters that stick with you. He's known for his characters, and yet sometimes he makes these perfect woman characters that that uh, are not as relatable. It was his uh, a fault of his. So she faints dead away for good reason. I mean, it's huge news. And then we get the first glimpse at one of my favorite underrated characters in the story, and that is Miss Pross. She's described as a wild-looking woman whom, even in Mr. Lorry's agitation, he observed to be all of a red color, to have red hair, to be dressed in some extraordinary tight-fitting fashion, and to have on her head a most wonderful bonnet like a grenadier wooden measure, and a good measure too, or a great Stilton cheese, came running into the room in advance of the, of the servants, and soon settled the question of his detachment from the poor young lady by laying a brawny hand upon his chest and sending him flying back against the nearest wall. I love that Miss Pross is introduced as this crazy, wild, red woman who basically Iron Man's Mr. Lorry against the wall with one hand. Uh, she's just magnificent. So she fawns upon Lucy, she calls her my precious, <laughs> which of course makes me think of Gollum, but... But uh, my precious, my little bird, she's so huge and tough but at the same time so soft. This is a female character I can get behind. This is somebody that I can 
that I can care about. And that's pretty much it. After, after that, we actually go to Paris to pick up Dr. Manette. So the preparation is all giving Lucy the news of her father's reappearance and getting ready to, to go and restore him to life. So this video is a little longer than I intended it to be for just one chapter, but it is an important chapter. So hopefully you got something out of this video. Make sure to subscribe for more English nerdy goodness, and I'll see you next week. Bye.